Father, we're very grateful. You've shown yourself to us to be a good God. You, Lord, you could be nothing other than that. And so I praise you for it, Lord. As we, we just meet one more time here, we open the word. I pray you'd help us, that you'd send your spirit, oh God. You'd convict us. You'd give us encouragement in Christ. Lord, we sing these songs. We have a high priest who is in heaven, whoever pleads for me, whoever pleads for us. What a glorious reality, Lord. What love you have displayed to us. Lord, how could it not transform us? How could we not in like manner walk in love, Lord? Help us. Father, I pray for this dear sister as our brother brought her to our attention. We pray for her family. Lord, you have the you're the God of comfort. I pray that you'd comfort her dear son. I can't even think about my, my child losing his mother. God, would you be gracious there? Meet with us, Father, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. First Corinthians 16 again. Just read this verse one more time. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Well, as we deal with the final message here, I think it's very fitting for us to end in this particular place. Acting like men in all things loving. And I say that because, number one, if we look at the life and the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the preeminent focus in the scriptures. We have no greater example by which to live than Jesus Christ. And he was preeminently the one who was in all things loving. And beyond that, of course, Jesus lived it out in the pages of the New Testament. We see it actually in action. But other than that, the rest of the New Testament is not silent on the matter. The rest of the New Testament tends to weigh in pretty heavily on love and its supreme importance in what ought to overshadow the Christian life. And of course, you're probably well familiar with one of the most emphatic statements about such things, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love. I am nothing if I give away all I have. And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And all of this is to show that love's importance is such that Paul's words sort of expound on the reality that not only can you gain the whole world and lose your soul, as Jesus certainly told us, but you could even give the whole world and even your own body to be burned and still lose your soul without love. This is no small thing for us. Jesus gave the disciples 
that commandment in the upper room. He says to them, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. I mean, that's Christ's commandment to the disciples. That's why Paul can say, Romans 13, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. In Galatians 5, the whole law is fulfilled in one word or one commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he's really just taking Christ's commandment to the disciples, and he is making it supreme. And by doing so, he's really just telling them that if you would do as Christ calls you to, and you would love as Christ calls you to love, you would show yourself to be a law keeper. And John brings it out again. This emphasis upon love, John brings it out in his first letter 1 John 3, he says, Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And you know what? We don't have to guess at what it is that John thinks that the commandments are because he tells us. And his commandment is this, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. James brings it out. The command of love is all over the place. There he calls it the perfect law, the law of liberty, the royal law. Brethren, over and over and over and over again. The, God is trying to get us to see something. Points us to love and Christ's example as the supreme image of it. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. Galatians 5, 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I mean, all of that is good. But then he says this, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. You've been taught that by God. 1 Timothy 1.5. I mean, can you have a better pointed direction of Paul's ministry and teaching? He says the aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Brethren, the point is this. God does not consider love to be cheap. In fact, he seems to put a pretty high premium on it all over the Bible. And as Jesus finishes giving that commandment to his disciples, he tells them, John 13, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, they will know that you love me. That you follow me because you love others. Brethren, if you want to find out which men are serious disciples of Jesus Christ and are worthy to be emulated, you need to look to this. Do they have a genuine, a pure-hearted love for the brothers, for the church, and, and for the world? For lost souls. Because without love, Paul says, nothing. Nothing is gain. There's no gain without it. And look, the thing is this. The world wants to ruin for us what biblical love is. 
They want to turn, they want to turn love into some kind of thing which protects them from anything that makes them uncomfortable. They use the word, they use the same word love, but they kind of change its definition. And they want to make it out to be something more that might be akin to open-minded. That's not love. That's not how the Bible defines love. That's not who God is. And therefore, that's not proper for us to live like that. God doesn't look like that in his love. We ought not look like that in our love. So even though the world wants to ruin it, it is biblical. And it is an example of what is true manhood. So what I want to do is this. I want to put on display for you God's love and how God has manifested it to us. Because if we can first and foremost display God and the Lord Jesus as the pinnacle of what it means to be filled with love, we will not only properly define it, which is very important, but it will give us an example to walk in. And that's what I want us to do here. And it's going to be a bit different. I mean, the other messages have been somewhat topical in nature. I mean, we've dealt with different scriptures but uh, in this one, I want to kind of spend our time in one particular section of the Bible. It's one of my favorite sections in Scripture. So turn to 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to hang out here pretty much the whole time. I'll make mention to a number of other places. But I want us to walk through this section. 1 John chapter 4, if I can open this. Verses 7 through 12, this passage gives us an explanation of where love comes from, the supreme example of love, a model to follow, and a call, of course, for us to put it into action. So I'm going to read this whole section here, and then we're going to jump back through and kind of see John's argument. Starting in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, in verse 7 and 8, go back up to the top here. John begins this section, and he states a positive proof of the one who has been born of God and a negative proof of the one who has not been born of God. And the proof itself is the same. It's love. And the question becomes, do you have it? Do you have this genuine love which is spoken about by John? Because it becomes the determinant factor in John's mind whether or not you know Jesus Christ. The determinant factor. John is able to lay it down as a biblical axiom. Anyone who does not have a heart of genuine love does not know God. How is he able to do that? Why can he say it? Why is this particular characteristic one in which John can say, if you don't have it, you don't know God, period. 
Well, I think it's because of what he ties it to. I mean, brethren, he ties it to the character of God. He says in verse 8, they don't know God because God is love. Love is fundamental to God's nature. And John's argument is this. If we claim to be children of the living God, those who have been made into his image, who are, who, are, who are claiming to walk in his likeness, who are claiming to imitate his nature, albeit to an imperfect degree. But his argument is if we do not emulate that which is God's most basic characteristic, how can we know that we even know him? If we claim to have encountered the living God who is love, and we don't mirror him in love, even to some smaller degree, brethren, then we have no reason to believe that we did encounter such a God. And on the flip side, this is the glorious part. Not only is that true, but brethren, the flip side is just as true. You can know that you have come to know God, or rather been known by God, because you do love. I mean, this is a supernatural thing. The heart that is bent on love is only a byproduct of regeneration. It does not come by any other means. I mean, think about this. Previous to such workings of God, here's what Paul says to Titus. We were passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Brethren, love was not normal. Hatred was normal. That was the default of our heart. Hatred was normal. In fact, it was so normal, Paul says that we were passing our days in it. It's like a man who sits out front on his porch and passes his day drinking a cup of lemonade. You know what we were doing? Passing our days in envy and hatred and hating people, and people were hating us. It's just the normal nature of the course of our lives. Yeah. He says to the Galatians that we were filled with fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, division, envy. He says to the Colossians that we were hostile in hostile hostile in mind doing evil deeds anger wrath malice slander obscene talk lying i mean that was the normal nature of our heart and we have to ask the case if this was the case and it was before christ most certainly then how did love come in I mean, how does that even enter in as part of who we are now? Because it wasn't present in who we were before. And the answer is, of course, it comes in supernaturally as a fruit wrought by the Spirit of God. Supernaturally. There's nothing natural about love. Love tops the list for Paul when it comes to the fruits of the Spirit. It is something, like we talked about last night, that is produced by the Spirit in the life of a Christian. Not something that, that we produce. Now look here at verse 9. John follows that up with the purest example of love, which in his argumentation is intended to motivate us. He tells us how the love of God was put on display for for everyone to see. It was made manifest. It was imaged. It was brought to light. And he says it was brought to light in this way. He sent his son that we might receive life through him. And if it ended there, we might have some questions, right? Well, why did, I mean, okay, he sent his son, but why did he send his son? What did he send his son to do exactly? And how is it that we receive life through him? Well, he tells us, of course, in the next verse, or just a little bit down in, the, in that verse, he says that he sent his son 
to be the satisfaction of God's wrath. To propitiate. I mean, it literally means to pacify. It's, it's like my child, he's one, and he'll scream. You take that pacifying, you stick it in his mouth. <laughs> and it stops the screaming. I mean, I know the image is not exact because God is not capricious in his anger. But brethren, you have to get this. Apart from Jesus Christ, God's wrath was coming towards you. And it was fierce. I mean, it was fierce. And he was going to judge you and he was going to cast you into a lake of fire. Jesus says where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There is nothing good there. And it says here that Jesus' death was to satisfy the fierce anger of God towards us. It pacified it. Brethren, we receive life because Jesus Christ received death in our place. And an exchange took place. An exchange which no man, no angel could have ever dreamed of. Brethren, if you would have stood before God and he would have said to you, what would you have me to do to glorify my name? None of us would have ever played out the plan that God had laid out. No one would have ever dreamed this up. God sends his son to take the place of a rebel, an enemy. That's what Paul says. While we were enemies, we were reconciled. He says Christ died for the ungodly. I mean, you get the weight of it. Christ, who's, who, what does Christ mean? Messiah, anointed one. This is the promised Messiah. You know, the Bible speaks about the promised Messiah, the righteous one, the perfect one. And Paul says that the Messiah died for the Messiah, who is God himself, come in the flesh, dies for God haters. I mean, it is an unbelievably glorious reality. There is no greater manifestation of love than that. There just cannot be. And brethren, I want to spend a bit of time here for a minute. I don't want to move on too quick from this. Because this is what John is intending to use to motivate us in love. And it needs to be what persuades us. The idea of the Son of God coming and being the place where all the wrath of God is now satisfied, and that being for you and I a substitute, something put in the place of another, that idea, brethren, and not just that Jesus is a, a, a satisfaction of God's wrath in some general sense over here, but that he is the satisfaction of God's wrath to you as an individual if you trust in Jesus Christ. It's like what Paul says in Galatians, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul doesn't make it, I mean, it is universal, of course, but Paul is trying to get the brethren to see God gave himself for me. In my place, the wrath of God towards you, brother, not to be astounding for us. And sadly, the reality is it's oftentimes just not astounding. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of ordinary at times. I mean, we talk about it, did Jesus died for our sins. I tell my kids all the time. I mean, if I ask my son, how did Jesus pay for our sins? He died on the cross. Are you a sinner? Yes. I mean, the answer is just repetitive. And we do this. It's just, it just becomes ordinary for us. And we have a hard time grasping this concept of substitutionary atonement. The, a death of, of one in place of another. And I think it's because that concept was not normative for us. It's never, as Gentile, anybody here Jewish? All right, you're all like me. <laughs> We're all Gentiles. And the fact of the matter is, that was not normative for us. But I want you to place yourself for a moment in the position of a Jew. And I think you will begin to see the weight of this kind of thing. 
the Jews, you see, they, they had particular visual aids, so to speak, that helped them to grasp the importance of a substitutionary atonement. I mean, they were slaughtering animals all the time, day after day, animal after animal, repetitive. And it was meant to signify for them an atonement, a substitution for their sins. And then certain times, like the Passover, for example, every family brings a lamb and they kill them all. I mean, folks, sometimes we have these numbers in the Bible and we just don't know what to do with them because they're not numbers like our numbers are. But, I mean, 500,000 lambs on the day of Passover would have not been even close to an overkill of how many animals they probably would have killed on that day. 500,000 lambs. It was repetitive. Over and over and over. Animal after animal. I mean, Hebrews 10 says, this served as a reminder for them every year for their sins. And they knew it was impossible, brethren, that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. They knew this because they had to keep offering them, of course. I mean, if it worked and their sins were completely dealt with, they would have a clean conscience and they would have not had to offer sacrifices anymore. But it, it did not deal with it. So day after day, month after month, year after year, it was like a giant, a giant, you guys may not have neon signs here, but we have them a lot in Las Vegas. It was like a giant neon sign over the altar with a big finger pointed at them that said, you deserve this. That's what it was for them. Constantly there, pointing at them, pointing out their sin, their need for a substitute in their place. No reprieve, no breaks, no intermission. And therefore, when John shows up on the scene and he says these words, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Imagine how astounding that would have been. Yeah. He didn't say many lambs of God who take away some of the sins of the world. He said the la one lamb taking away all the sins of the world. I mean, it would have been absolutely shocking to them. And no doubt, that's why the author of the Hebrews is having to just hammer this point. I mean, these people are being led back into sacrifices in Judaism because, of course, brethren, how could their question not have been, could God really wipe out all of our sin with one sacrifice. I mean, he didn't do it with all of the other ones. Billions and billions of animals dead. And that didn't wipe out all of our sin. How in the world can this one man do it? And they're being led back to that. And listen, while we never had any of those visual aids, we didn't have that kind of thing. But the need for a substitutionary propitiatory sacrifice was nonetheless the same for us as it was for them. Yeah. I mean, brethren, we were so wicked in the sight of God. Paul tells the Ephesians this. You were separated, separated from Christ, having no hope yeah. and without God in the world. You were literally without hope. You had no hope, brethren. No hope without God in the world. We were slaves to our sin. I mean, you were being led around by the devil like a pig with a ring in its nose. Sons of daughters of disobedience. Cut from the same cloth as Cain, who beat his brother over the head with a rock. That's who we are from. Outside of Christ, that's where we are. That's our nature. You lived by your own passions, carrying out whatever desires you had in your heart and in your mind, and you were, as Paul says, a child of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. 
birthed, as it were, for judgment on a one-way track. That's how wicked we were. And it was in that state that Paul says to the Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy. I mean, rich in mercy. Riches beyond comprehension. Rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. I mean, resurrection life. Why, brethren? You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Nobody here earned that from God. Great love for you. While you were dead in your sins, not after, you, not after you did something to earn your way to God, not after you did a lot of good acts and therefore drew yourself close to God and then God came in and did the rest, you were nowhere to be seen, lost in a sea of iniquity. And God came along and he looked at your frail, ugly, dead body, just like he did mine, and he said, I love you and I will redeem you. I mean, brethren, that he breathed life into us. Yeah. The depths of love is, I mean, it's where Colossians 2 enters in. Where Paul says that though we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with him. Having forgiven us all of our trespasses, I mean, all of your trust, all of your sins, they're all gone. They're not seen anymore. If you are a Christian, there's not a single sin still on your account. Forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. I mean, it was an enemy of us. We had a, a record of debt that stood against us and it accused us. It stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I mean, brethren, when it says that he nailed it to the cross, it does not mean that he wrote your sins down and he went over and he stuck them on the cross. Brethren, he nailed the Messiah to the cross. That's how your sins are there. He nailed the Messiah to the cross. That's how your sins are nailed there. And then it came to pass, of course, as the hymn says, on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Amen. Wrath of God, satisfied, done, it is finished. Father, receive my spirit. And this is John's motivation for us. I mean, he says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And then he takes us into the classroom of God's display of this attribute. What does it look like that God has loved us? What does it look like that God has displayed his love? And folks, that's what it looks like. Jesus Christ taking your place as a rebel sinner. You didn't deserve it. You were unrighteous. You were without hope, without God in the world, living in abominations, and God still loved you. He still did it. And brethren, if you're going to imitate things, look to imitate the best things. And this is undoubtedly the best thing to imitate. God sends his son, perfect son, brings us rebellious traitors into his... You sing that song? Once your enemy, now seated at your table. We didn't love him, not even in the slightest. And he showed infinite love for us. And this drives us here to the next point in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And John considers this the necessary outcome of, of what God has done for us in love. 
He tells us if God loves us, then we ought to love one another. And brethren, how could it even be any other way? How could someone truly encounter the love of God to that great degree and then go away unchanged? I mean, at some point, this statement is almost unnecessary. I mean, of course, John, (laughs) if God loved us, then yes, we love. I mean, how could we not do that in light of what God has done for us? Brethren, if you claim to be a Christian and pondering the love of God in his sacrifice for sinners, and it does not spur you on to love your brothers, to love your wife, to love the church, to love the lost. Brethren, you might want to stop calling yourself such a thing because that stains this name. Whoever loves has been born of God, and whoever has been born of God, they love. They do it. It just is. It's just an axiom. John says it. Jesus says it. The Word of God is is clear on that. But the question I want to ask is this. I mean, like I said, it almost seems unnecessary for John to say, God has loved us, therefore we should love. So what I want to do then is ask the question, well, how, right? What does that actually look like? How exactly do we love? So if you remember, I said, and Scripture says this, not not me, but love is a fruit of the Spirit. It's produced in the life of of a Christian by the Spirit of God. And as such, its nature is of a supernatural nature. I mean, whatever the world does and calls it love, it's a cheap imitation of what is biblical love in the scriptures. It's not supernatural. And since John is calling us to love because God has loved us, I want us to see at least a few of the characteristics of what kind of shapes what biblical love looks like. Because of who God is, who he's shown himself to be to us, And because of Jesus Christ, some of the things that we want to be shaped by in love is sacrificial love, an unconditional love, and a love which flows from the heart. So this first one, a sacrificial love. I mean, this is the kind of love that is not concerned with what can be gained in return. Remember what our Lord said? You invite people to your home. Who are you to invite to your home? Those who can't can't repay it back to you. Why? Because you'll receive it in the resurrection, he says. Jesus said to give to all who ask of you. Paul says bear one another's burdens. I mean, there is a sense in which you as a Christian will have to give up things to love properly. You will have to give up time. You will have to give up your money. You will have to give up your priorities, your comfort, your peace, and whatever else is necessary to give up, to love sacrificially. That's what it means for it to be. It has to hurt, brethren. It has to hurt sometimes to put others before ourselves and to love sacrificially. And this is exactly what's laid out for us in Philippians chapter 2. Paul exhorts the church and he says, do nothing. We looked at this at at James' house one morning with the kids. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Nothing? I mean, you're supposed to do not a single thing with a view towards self in the Christian life. You're to steer clear of doing anything with a motivation of self. Instead, what? Count others as more significant, looking to the interest of another individual. And if we're doing nothing from selfish ambition, which is what God calls us to, then of course we have to ask the question, what in the world ought to be our ambition? Well, it's the edification and the building up of the brethren. That's what it has to be for. All things are to be done for that. It's not just that you don't do stuff for self-glorification. It is that you 
make yourself busy for the building up and edification of the brethren. Sacrificial love is to give and to give and to give and to do it with joy, though you may never receive anything in return. I mean, and brethren, there cannot be anything more Christ-like than that. Secondly, Christian love is unconditional. Unconditional. And if there is anything about Christian love that is so antithetical to the way that the world thinks about love, it's this one. The world's love is almost completely conditional. Relationships are built upon kept conditional requirements. End of story. That's how the world works. I mean, wedding vows mean almost nothing. I, just, I was just at my brother's wedding as an unbeliever, and they had wedding vows. I mean, they didn't even say till, till death do us part. I mean, they didn't say half the stuff that we typically say in our wedding vows. I mean, they might as well could have just said, I promise to love you until I don't. I mean, it's literally all that it means for them. Everything is conditional. All relationships are built upon that kind of thing. And as a lost individual, I don't doubt that many of you probably lost many friendships and relationships simply because of offenses given or taken. And I recognize that that can tend to happen more with women because of the way that we're built, we're not as emotional in that kind of sense. So maybe it doesn't happen as much, but brethren, is it not true that you probably have people in your life previous to Christ that your friendship was built upon preconceived ideas and conditions of a relationship, whatever those may have been, and when those particular conditions were broken, they wronged you, they said something to you, bam, right down the middle, friendship gone. I mean, all of it was built upon conditional requirements. Recall to your mind the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5. He tells them, you need to love your enemies. Because by doing so, you what? You imitate your father. You act as a good and proper son, living as he has shown himself to be. Because that's what God does. He gives rain both to the wicked and the just and the righteous. And Jesus goes on to say that if you only love those who love you back, what good is that? That's how the, that's how the Gentiles love. That's, that's how lost people love. They love people who love them. They don't love people who don't love them. There's nothing distinct about that. There's nothing unconditional. That is actually completely conditional to love those who love you. That's not Christian love. I mean, brethren, to love, even though the object of our love is not deserving of it, is the essence of Christian love. I mean, that is the essence of what Christ has done to us, undeserving people. In Jesus Christ, God the Father showed love for us. That, for us, is the example. And then lastly, this. The Christian love is a love which comes from the heart, brethren. I mean, it's just, it's outflowing of the heart. It's not something that needs to be rigorously produced in the mind and in the flesh. Peter puts it like this, 1 Peter 1, 22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love love one another earnestly from a pure heart i mean that's the idea this love comes from a pure and earnest heart one which has been made new in the new covenant god promises that he would give us what a new heart your heart is not desperately wicked anymore your heart is new it's a heart that wants to love a heart that is led by love and the Christian knows this shift. A love for others that is totally unexplainable. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, I loved people that beforehand I hated. I didn't love the Bible before, and I didn't love Christians. And when God saved me, I loved his word, and I loved God's people. 
I mean, how do you explain that? This is how we imitate God in his love. That's how we do it. Those, those are the ways in which we can display that out. Now, finally, look at this. Verse 12. This is sort of the capstone of John's argument. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is an interesting thing here at the end. The idea is essentially this, that we can put God on display, manifest him to the world by loving as God has loved. I want to show you this. He begins this point by saying this, no one has ever seen God. It's an interesting statement in the middle because he hasn't dealt with that. I mean, he's just been talking about love for one another, God's display of love towards us, how we are now to love one. I mean, and then he says, no one has ever seen God. It seems almost like it's out of nowhere. But he has to state this because of the point he is about to make. He wants us to grasp the fact that although God himself is invisible, the love which corresponds to his nature ought not be invisible. That ought to be displayed to the world. We are told that if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. And brethren, this affects us because we are being told that the world can't see God, but what they can see is us who have God himself in the person of the Spirit indwelling us and residing in us. And because of this, God is seen. God's love is seen. Or at least John's point is it ought to be. It ought, they may not see God, but they can see you, the Spirit of God, producing in you that which is God's basic characteristic, to love. Brethren, this is so important for us because our witness cannot ring hollow to the world. Our claim to discipleship our claim to Christianity, to be those who follow Jesus Christ, it must be accompanied by a deep, abiding love that pours forth from the heart, from the Spirit of God, towards the brethren, towards the lost world around us. I mean, Paul says it to the Galatian church. We, we, we read it earlier. Faith working through love. This is the display of faith. It is love being working itself. That's what faith does. It works out in love. Love is the practical outworking of faith in God. It is to show the world around us who God is. So we have this inspired account. Where love began. In God, in the heart of God, not in us, began in the heart of God. How it was displayed, his giving of the Son, and how we ought to live. I mean, to love as he did. And the world around us does want to determine what love is. They want to tell you what it is to be loving and what it is to be mean. Brethren, we need to define it biblically. And maybe in times past, see, this has shifted over the years. Maybe in times past, loving may have been overshadowed by a real pressure upon men to be tough. And now they've just, I mean, they've passed over toughness, they've passed over loving, and they've landed over there on a feminine. And now the most manly men are supposed to be men who wear dresses. We've, we've just gone way over to the other side. And Jesus would have never loved such things. We are to love what is good and hate what is evil. Hating what is evil is a loving thing. When love has been shaped biblically, brethren, we can be in all things loving. To act like men 
and to be shaped by love is a very biblical way to walk. It is to be like Christ. Brethren, that we would have a compassionate heart for the lost, like Jesus. Like he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. A love for the disciples of Christ, a heart to see them mature, to grow, to develop. A love for the church. Brethren, to see the bride of Christ adorned for her husband. To see the church beautified. A love for righteousness. That we would be holy as our Father is holy. And above all, brethren, a love for God. Our supreme portion. Our supreme and greatest joy. And brothers, like I said, it's fitting that we end here. Because this is the supreme example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we go out, I mean, if you shape yourself by this, all other things will fall in. I mean, you give yourself to a life of prayer, a life of watchfulness. You give yourself to determine to love the brethren and to love the world out there, to hate evil, to love good. Brethren, all other things are going to fall in line. Let us love with the heart of Christ. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. His display to us is like nothing that could have ever been seen. I mean, Lord, we would have never, we would have never conjured up such glorious things. And, and our Lord Jesus and his display towards us in giving himself for me. I mean, I ha- Lord, I hated you. And you loved me. Lord, my thoughts, they were blasphemous to Christ. I cursed his name. I cursed people who, who loved the Lord. And you still snatched me out, Lord. I cannot even believe how wonderful you have been. Father, even now, as we now finish these messages, Lord, is it the case that there are still men here who do not know this love of Christ? I mean, why, Lord? Why is it that they would go on in their rebellion, hardening their hearts? Lord, you tell us in your word now, is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Not even five minutes from now. Lord, come in power. Convict them as they sit in their seat that the kindness of you, O God, would lead them to repentance. Amen.